So the library is thrilled uh, to have you here with us today. Uh, thank you so much, Robert, for taking time to talk with me and for Jillian uh, also at Simon & Schuster for sending me an advanced reader's copy of the book and for making today's event possible. So to begin, I will share a condensed bio. After gra graduating law school in Toronto, Robert moved to Paris, where he became the managing editor of Passion, Paris's magazine for English speakers. He then returned to Canada and published his own magazine, TO, the magazine covering everything Toronto. He then spent a year as a film executive and a year at CBC Radio before he opened his own law practice. Over the last 30 years, he has become one of Toronto's top criminal lawyers, defending, as he likes to say, everything from murder to shoplifting. His first novel, Old City Hall, was published in 2009. It was a bestseller and was translated into nine languages. Since then, he has written four other best-selling books. His sixth novel, Downfall, which we'll be discussing in further detail today, uh, was released just yesterday. A frequent public speaker, he's also co-written screenplays for Murdoch Mysteries and teaches writing to budding writers and lawyers. Welcome, Robert. Thank you so much for joining us today. Bonjour, Daniel. <laughs> so just as many of the best-selling authors I've had on Zoom over the course of the past few months, uh, you worked as an editor for a magazine. How did this experience fit in when it comes to your writing style? You know, that's a great question. Um, and in the years when I was in the magazine business, we didn't really have computer editing. We had com primitive computers. So you would lay out a story, say you'd sell a story that was 1,500 words, and last minute, the publisher would say, we just sold mad, you got to cut 150, 200 words out of that story in 20 minutes. So I, I learned very early on to cut, 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 to really keep my writing as clean and precise as possible. And, um, you know, really to just write, get to the point and, and really keep it clean. And I did it for years and years. It also taught me how to take criticism because there's nothing worse when you're an editor than to be fighting with a, a writer over every word. And criticism is very important. I have uh, four or five friendly readers who give me feedback. And of course, I've got a great editor and I've got my agent. And I, they always kind of remark how undefensive I am. And it's because if it's a better idea, if it's going to work better, uh, that helps. The irony is you could send me any piece of copy and I could pick up almost every spelling or grammar mistake. But my own stuff, I think it's because I write and rewrite so many hundreds of times that I can't copy edit my own stuff. <laughs> but I, I think it was a fantastic, fantastic training for me. And I still, I don't know if you were a favorite editor, um, in the old days we didn't edit on, we edited on paper. And I still print everything out and I still use all the cursive uh, marks for, uh, for editing. And when I'm teaching someone, I print it out and then I do all my hand edits and then I scan it and send it back to them. Uh, I just find there's something about holding something in your hand and seeing it that makes you see it much better. That's yeah, interesting. Question. I've been asked so many questions, I've never been asked that one. Before. <laughs> Thank you. Interesting to learn a little bit about your process. Um, so another thing you are uh, excellent at doing in, in your book is integrating uh, your experience as a lot as a lawyer so how do you go about um, integrating your sort of other work life as a lawyer into your um, career as a writer well you know I have a kind of cliche thing I say now that being a lawyer has made me a better writer and being a writer has made me a better lawyer and unlike most criminal lawyers who are just very verbal um, I actually settle most of my case I'm just in medical correspondence right now the Crown Attorney, by really gaining on my client, really thinking through the whole case, what we call peeling back the onion, and really putting together really lengthy proposals how to settle cases. 
I settle about 99% of my cases. Um, and I do that by writing and thinking of what the real story is. And in many ways, that's what writing about a character is. You have to kind of figure out who the character is, what his or her public life is, private life, secret life, what their own goals are, what their desires are, what their needs are. And you know, every book is a journey. And you want every character to go on a journey of, of discovery, both external and internal. For example, I'll give you a quick example. I know you, I'm very glad you read the book. Uh, there is a young reporter in a book uh, named Allison Green. And she's a young reporter. It's a long story if you haven't read the books, but she was born in England and she found out she had this father named Barry Green. Her mother has died, so she comes to Toronto and then she finds out she has a grandfather who's a Holocaust survivor. So she's not only pursuing the story about homelessness and there's a, there's a killer who's killing homeless women and she's becoming politicized about the poverty in Toronto, but she's also going on her own internal journey to try and figure out who she is and her relationship with her grandfather and her father. So I, um, and in many ways, when I'm dealing with my clients, it's the same kind of thing. They have to kind of, you know, there's a famous writer named Kubler Ross who wrote this book called On Death and Dying with the six stages of, of, of dying. It's about people who are facing mortality. They go through shock, anger, denial, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And in many ways, that's what my clients go through uh, once they realize the situation they're in. But in many ways, that's what you want a character to go through. So by the end of the novel, you want the character to d discover something about themselves. The yes, sir. She discovered her red shoes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, there, there is an arc with Allison where she, she definitely grows uh, throughout the course of the novel. Mm -hmm. So before we get uh, too much more into the novel itself and the characters, first, I'll say congratulations on a riveting uh, page to a fast paced uh, page turning book uh, that addresses timely social issues. Um, and I understand it's a uh, the book is rising very quickly to uh, number one in the charts, so congratulations on that. Thank you. So I'm going to share, for those who haven't gotten a chance to read, I guess pretty much everyone who's listening in has not had the opportunity just yet uh, to read uh, Robert's latest book, Downfall. So here is a very short synopsis. In this gripping and topical thriller, detectives dig deep into the dark side of Toronto when a serial killer targets homeless people who are camped out near one of the city's most exclusive enclaves. What follows is a cold and crucial hard look at the shameful disparity between rich and poor, the homelessness crisis, and the systematic fallings on the part of the government and the police to provide adequate care for some of the most vulnerable and underserved people in our society. So, Robert, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, why this topic? Well, with every book, I don't really, people talk about genres and how this is a murder mystery. I don't actually think of genres for books. I'm just writing about the city in the present day. I happen to be a criminal lawyer, so that's my perspective. Um, and murder is always a great way to start a book. Um, but each book that I've written is about something that's going on in the city. Uh, I wrote a book called Stray Bullets, which was about, we've had this real acceleration of gun violence in the city that 30 years ago when I was practicing, I never saw that. And, um, and I had a book called Stranglehold, which is about an out of control mayor. You may have heard about our previous mayor in Toronto. Uh, the last book, called Heart of the City, it's all about the condo building craze. And Danielle, you said you don't know Toronto very well, but if you come here, you'll see more building cranes than anywhere in the world, except I believe Dubai. Uh, so this book, and, and I think what readers don't understand is, I didn't write the book yesterday. It was about two, two and a half years ago that I thought of this idea. So what I try to do is stand back and look at what's really going on in the city. 
not the daily news, but what's really happening. And in Toronto, I grew up in a city and it was a very middle class city. I never saw poverty. I never saw beggars on the street, tents in the park, people sleeping on sidewalks, nor did I ever see this extreme wealth we have now. Limousines, expensive cars, gorgeous houses. Um, and to me, the city is in this very radical transition between rich and poor. So to show that, writers always talk about showing and not telling. I create a fictional, private, very wealthy golf course on a river called the Humber River, one of the two rivers that divide the city. And right beside it, I put a fictional homeless encampment. And, uh, and then someone who starts to kill women in the homeless encampment. But to me, I really want to highlight in a very, very stark and dramatic way the contrast between ultra-rich and ultra-poor in the city. So that's what I want to write about. I can't say I knew that COVID was going to come along and make it even worse, but I can say that I saw this problem coming from, from a long way away, this kind of third world in the midst of the first world. I mean, right now, if anyone knows Toronto, my office is very near the St. Lawrence Market District, right downtown, and within five blocks of me, there are the wealthiest people in the country and the poorest people of the country. There's really right up next against each other, quite stark. So one of the uh, issues that does come up throughout the book, and I think throughout all of Canada, even Montreal now, is um, as, as you discussed, the disparity between the rich and the poor and the gentrification of neighborhoods that uh, had begun as middle class neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and your perspective in what's going on in Toronto? Well, I can't see the participants, but I believe my friend Ted Feld, who's a photographer who took all those great pictures of me in the book, uh, he and I went to a school called Ledbury in Toronto. And Ted, if you're listening, I actually went up there yesterday, <laughs> go by there to go to the bagel shop we always go to. I mean, with COVID, you have to try to find something to do. And um, it was a very middle-class neighborhood. There was all these post-war houses, these tiny little houses everyone grew up in. Now there are all these mini mansions. Um, and, you know, city needs diversity. You, you can't just have wealthy people. You just, you have to have working class people. You have to, I mean, you need, you need people who can do every types of job or every type of thing. Um, so you see people being squeezed out. Um, another thing, and this is something that was I brought up in the last book, is um, there's a lot of anxiety for people my age about their kids. How are the kids going to be able to afford to live in the city? You know, when we were younger, we, we bought our first house for less than $150,000. That house today is worth a million, five, a million, six. So um, I think there's anxiety at every level. Um, you know, all these kids who are living at home and the rent's going up. Uh, so I think the financial pressure is really on everyone. Yeah, we have that, um, perhaps not to the same extent as you do in Toronto or in Vancouver, but we uh, also, it's becoming less and less affordable to be able to buy within the city. Right. I think uh, younger families are getting pushed out, um, whether by choice or economics, uh, outside of the city core. So, I mean, what's interesting about writing about Toronto is it's a city that's really, really in transition. You know, the essence of drama is conflict. If there's no conflict, there's no drama. You know, you got Hamlet, his father has been killed. Did his uncle kill him or not? He loves his mother, he hates his uncle. There you've got your conflict triangle. And in Toronto, the conflict is between the old and the new, and it's, it's maturing from being this kind of very placid city to a big time city. And so there's all the great things about it. My kids can't believe I grew up in a city that didn't have sushi and all these different <laughs> kinds of food. It was a very boring city. But when to get all that stuff, you also you also get the violence, you get the rich, you get the poor. So you can hear an ambulance right outside the door right now. 
So we spoke a little bit uh, definitely about how Toronto uh, is almost a character in in and of itself uh, throughout your novel, and it has a very important place in in your writing. Um, But another thing to me that stood out is uh, the details. Uh, It's it's been said that um, the devil is in the details. Um, So can you tell us how important it is to you to get the details right? The details are everything. I mean, I'm, I'm... Meticulous to the point of being obsessive. Um, and I think you have to be. Um, I'll give you a very, very simple example. There's a scene where Allison goes to a drop-in center, a homeless, a women's homeless shelter. And one of the things in the scene is a sign that's on the door. And it's kind of a nasty sign. It says, it warns the women that violence will not be tolerated. And I made sure that it was written exactly right. And the copy editor tried to change the copy because the writing was, it wasn't quite grammatically correct. I said, no, 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 it has to be right. Um, but one of the lines as she's thinking about going in is there's this young doctor who she's met, who she's kind of interested in, he's very dynamic. And he says to her, you know, she's trying to get a woman to go on camera to do a TV story. And she says, women are much more reluctant than men to talk about themselves, homeless women. Now, I wouldn't have known that. So I went to two people. I went to a client of mine named James, who I've known for 30 years. I've known him since he was 12 years old. He's been homeless. He's slept under bridges. Uh, I've supported him. He's been part of my life. I've been part of his life forever. He's very, very smart. I had him read the the section and say, does that work? And then I have a friend named Carol, who was in my podcast the other night, she read it and she said to me, you know, women are much more reluctant than men to go on camera. So that line's in there. And that to me, I, I think the readers know if you're making it up or if it's real. Um, so I, I really appreciate that comment because I love getting all the details right. And even though it's fiction, within the fiction about Toronto, Everything I say, I talk about a Portuguese cafe at five in the morning. Well, I've gone there many times at five in the morning. And, and the names on the back of the, uh, of the jerseys or the, the coats of the workers, those are the exact details. Generally, I mean, if you're a writer out there, um, I'll go to a place, for example, like that cafe. I'll write 10, maybe five, 10 pages of notes. And in the book, you'll get two or three. You have to, it's like Hemingway said, you know 100% and you only show the reader 5%, but you distill it down to the real core point, which ironically is what you do also as a lawyer. You really want to get to the key points. Thank you, Robert. So you definitely you spoke about uh, the importance of getting the details right, um, having visited uh, some of the shelters, I'm sure you cons- uh, consulted uh, with people who uh, are responsible for forensics investigations and for autopsies right. um, to the police force. Um, but you also just talked about how um, daily observations uh, is an important part of your writing. So to what extent, um, like how much time would you spend just observing the city to get all the insights uh, for your writing? You know, that's a great question. My biggest research is walking. <laughs> it might sound foolish, but just walking, thinking, looking at the city, getting a sense of it. In one of the books, I had a scene in a graveyard. I went to about 15 graveyards till I found the one that, that really worked. Um, a story has to live in your head. And you have to, it, I don't quite know how it happens, but somehow you have to just get the whole feel for it. And... Um, that's part of the real joy of it. It's kind of you create this fictional world that becomes real to you and then hopefully it becomes real to the reader. So we'll talk a little bit about the book itself. Sure. Um, so there are many interesting characters uh, in your novel, um, including the three amigas, Melissa, Lydia, and Nancy, uh, Mr. Hodgson, uh, Ari Green, and his daughter, um, Allison, Dr. Burns, 
Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with all this uh, variety of uh, colorful and very different characters? Well, I guess you can see behind me, this is my sixth book. Um, and so most of these characters are continuing characters. Some of them have showed up in later books. I killed off one of my main characters at the end of book four. Readers were very mad at me, but that's part of the the series. Um, Let's talk about the three Amigas. Um, The three Amigas are three women who met at law school. And in Toronto, we have something called Articling, where you work at a law firm. And there were three women um, among a group of 15. So they really bonded together. And the main character, and I was thinking today, you know, most of the main characters in this book are women, actually. Um, is Nancy Parrish. Now, she's a continuing character in the series, and readers of the series know her. She's a very, very talented woman, uh, kind of in her mid-30s, late-30s, single. She's kind of struggling with some, some of those issues, but, um, and she does have a predilection for younger men, which people know about from the series. But um, more importantly, she's met these two people, these two other women, and Danielle, I bet you in your own life have seen this. When you look at the friends you grew up with, and then one day you turn around and you see one's become huge success, but the other, someone else has fallen off. Um, and their life has just fallen apart. And you may have tried and tried to help them, but in the end, we can only help people so much. And so that's what happens with Nancy. Not to give anything away, but I think that's something people can really identify with that you all seem to start at the same point, and yet one person goes up and one person has a downfall. And without giving too much away, one person becomes very successful and the other one becomes homeless. And then the successful one marries the homeless one's ex-husband. So uh, drama happens in threes. And so that's a triangle where you can see there's lots and lots of conflict. And I very intentionally put Nancy Parrish, who's really the character I want the readers to follow, in the middle. Because I want you to think, what would you do? Uh, At one point, she goes to this very, very wealthy party, and she feels kind of out of place, because that's not really her life. On the other hand, she tries to help her other friend, and sometimes you try to help people, and it it backfires. So um, I thought that relationship was really, really, really important. And again, she's going on two journeys. She's going on the external journey of trying to figure out what happened and her own conscious, her own internal journey about about how she's going to grow in this whole situation. I love love writing about the characters. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. Don't tell anyone. The murder and the mystery, it's really just an excuse to write about the characters. Uh, You know, when I wrote the first book, Old City Hall, uh, that was in 2009, and Shaftesbury Film, the people who do Murdoch Mysteries and a number, they bought the rights to the book, and they said, oh, this would be great, like a murder a week. You, you know, most TV back then was a like law and order, one case a week. And I said to them, I have to tell you, my books are way too complicated for that. You need to do them over five or six hours. And they said, oh, no one does movie of the week anymore. That was 2009 before Netflix, right? Um, So I've always wanted books to, because if you look at all these Netflix series that people love, they're about the characters. The plot is important, but if the characters aren't complex and changing and different, then there's no interest. Can you tell us a little bit more about... um... So, so we discussed a little bit uh, about the bond uh, between the three ladies that, that we ref- you refer to as the three amiga. Um, I particularly found the character of Melissa uh, very interesting. Um, her conspiracy theories and uh, how often we hear that brilliant minds can sometimes be a little bit eccentric. Um, can you talk a little bit about that or if she was based uh, on someone you know or on an actual case? Well, I, I know a lot of smart people and then I know a lot of brilliant people. And as a client of mine once said about her gifted son, being gifted is a disability. And um, 
and I've seen a lot of these type of people, these type of lawyers implode and their, their lives fall apart. Some of them are well known for doing that. Um, uh, uh, someone I know who I'm now actually tutoring to be a writer was telling me about her brilliant first husband who, uh, and I, I used to be that, who'd be up all night, who'd be sleeping, been sleeping in the office and just working insane hours. And, um, and uh, so I've seen that kind of character. And um, too smart for their own good, I guess, is a good way to put it. And I wasn't quite sure what kind of lawyer she was going to be. And I love symbols. So, you know, I was an English literature student. So I hit upon the idea that what she did in her law practice was she loved beautiful clothes. And, and she became incredibly popular with all these French designers. And they would fly her to Paris. And when she becomes homeless, I, I think, I guess I shouldn't say this, but I, I, I wonder, do you find it compelling? Did you find it compelling when Nancy is unpacking her, her bag of clothes and all these gorgeous things that she bought are now nothing more than rags? And, and, and that kind of speaks to, I mean, everything. Like, I remember, this is a bit of a side, I remember when the Eaton store closed in Toronto. I grew up in Toronto. Eaton's was, I mean, Eaton's was like as solid as a rock. And I remember walking through there the last few days and they had everything like on wood planks and, and all that fancy clothes and stuff. It all just looked like junk, you know? So, so how much of our life is real and how much of it is an illusion? And that's, I think, the existential question we all deal with every day. Definitely, I think uh, COVID has brought uh, this question up to the forefront uh, of, of everyone's mind, uh, regardless of your area of work. What, what really is meaningful today, yeah. uh, given that everything has changed? Um, so on another topic, how um, you wrote this book, uh, you discussed a little bit earlier, a few, you didn't just write it, so you were not aware that we would have COVID and that homelessness uh, would keep uh, increasing uh, in Toronto and throughout Canada. But how has COVID impacted um, homelessness in Toronto? You know, I actually don't think the homelessness is, has increased. The visibility of it has increased. We've gone 40 years without a national housing strategy. There's, there's a men's shelter up the street from here. It's got 850 beds. It's the biggest one in Canada. 12 years ago, they made a report. They've got to change it. They've got to cut it down to a human scale. I actually met the architect who was doing it 12 years ago. Now, uh, we have an excellent mayor now, John Tory. He's really pushing to get this done. But I think it's, and I hope, listen, the book is a fun book to read. I, I hope when people aren't, aren't hearing this, they think, oh, this is some serious diatribe about homelessness. It's not at all. I, I like to say I write uh, airplane reading for smart people. <laughs> I mean, it's a thriller, it's fun to read, it's, it's got some humor in it, um, some humanity. Um, it's not a lecture about homelessness. I'm not a homeless advocate. I don't have the answers, but I know that by just ignoring the problem, that's the biggest mistake. You know, I mean, the solutions aren't easy. In California, they, they spent a billion dollars to try to cure homelessness, and it, it's still not working. There's, but, but when you see ideas that are smart ideas and that they're not, not working on them. Now, having said that, I mentioned my client, James. Um, just the other day, he was in. I have a picture of him with my book. He's a great reader. And for the first time in his life, first time he's 42 years old, first time in his life he has his own apartment. It's, there's a guard there, there's social workers there. But then I said to him, so are you going to be able to stay there? He said, I'm not sure if I can make it or not. So that's, that's the gray zone where the drama is. And that's what interests me. So while researching this book, um, did you find out more about the resources that are available to the homeless? Well, I found out 
a few shocking statistics. And, and I like to think I'm pretty well informed. Um, but I didn't know that 37% of the homeless people are women. And, uh, and that homeless people have a 50% life expectancy than non-homeless people. So we have in, within our society, one of the richest countries in the world, we're allowing 10,000 people a year to die 40 years old. And whatever your politics, whatever you think, um, you can't think that that's, that's a good idea. I've lost a number of clients to, I just heard about one the other day, to Fenlon. I've lost um, Fenlon, Fedlin, I'm mispronouncing it. Fentanyl. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. We had uh, uh, Daniel Kala um, now quite a few months back, but he uh, heads up um, a major hospital downtown Vancouver. So we got to speaking a little bit uh, about the opioid crisis because at the time uh, he and I spoke, that was uh, COVID was present in Vancouver, but hadn't uh, reached the scale it has now. And the opioid uh, crisis was something he, he was seeing more and more. And, and this is something that you touch upon uh, in the book, of course, is um, the problems associated with homelessness. So the uh, drug dependencies, uh, mental health. Um, you know, Daniel, I also want to show how homeless people aren't like some other tribe, some weird people. And one of the characters, uh, she was a nurse at a hospital and she just had a terrible fall and then she got hooked on medication and she ends up on the street and her husband and her two sons, like, where did mom go? She didn't have any psychological problems. She didn't have any mental health problems. It's just, it's just on the edge, you know, there's that line from Paul Simon's song, the line is finally drawn between joy and sorrow. You know, like, you know, slipping over the razor's edge. And, and I, I want people not to think, oh, that's the other. I want people to think, you know, that could be me. That there could be a Melissa in my life. One of my friends could have gone that way. Um, so so I, think, I think you did that very efficiently because it, <laughs> it was easy to tell how one mistake or one mishap could have really turned a, a person's life upside down. And then not only what happened to that person, but that person's uh, extended family and, and this kind of social waves that makes from that one person. And that was something I really want to write about that I never hear anyone talk about. Um, and I see it a lot in my practice. Uh, I've had clients who steal their kids' money to go out buy drugs. I've had clients who didn't show up at their kids' birthday parties because they were sleeping on the street. I, I, and I see the people who are abandoned by the homelessness. So a lot of the book is, I've seen grandparents who have to raise their grandkids because their daughters or sons are out on the street. Um, I've seen very resentful siblings of uh, formerly very wealthy, successful people who've just gone to the street. Uh, so no one ever talks about the people who get left behind, the families who lose a mother or father or brother. Um, and I see it all the time. And I, I think that's a really important part of the, the story. Having said that, it sounds so serious. I mean, I hope, I, I hope you laughed at some points. I hope you enjoyed it. You know? Definitely, there were a few laughs, and I enjoyed uh, the drama. So um, one of the characters I personally uh, enjoyed a lot, even though he was not one of the main characters, uh, was Allison's uh, grandfather. Can you tell us a little bit more about that character? Yeah, it's very interesting you said that because in many ways, in all the books, he's got the most response. Um, so the story is his, is his name is Yitzhak Green. He was born in Poland and he was born in a small town in Poland, which had 4,000 people, 4,000 Poles. People tend to say 2,000 Poles, 2,000 Jews. No, no. The Jews were in Poland for 500 years. There was 2,000 were Catholic, 2,000 were, were Jewish, and they all got along fine for 500 years. And then on this one night in, in uh, 1942, the Nazis arrived and they shipped everyone to Warsaw and then to Treblinka, and only two people survived. 
and he's one of them. And he lost his wife and his young children. Uh, so you would think that he would be a desperately damaged person. He might meets his wife in what's called a DP camp, which I'm actually very interested in that era. I'm researching a lot for my next book. He comes to Toronto, he has one son, Ari, who's really the main character. He's, he's the only Jewish homicide cop uh, in Toronto. And, um, but he's a very, very alive character. And I was very determined writing about him. And he could have been Jewish, he could have been East Indian, he could have been, uh, I find sometimes like people from so-called minorities are always portrayed as sweet and nice, you know, little mosque on the prairie, very unrealistic. He's a very alive character. He's very funny. Um, he is not, he doesn't look at himself as a victim. He doesn't look at himself as a survivor. In some of the other books that you haven't seen yet, he's dating Russia, a Russian woman who had a couple, who says she's Jewish because she, she pretended to be Jewish to get out of Israel. And he's, he, he's very alive, he's very funny, but he's also very wise because he's seen things that you and I haven't seen. And, and growing up in Toronto, this wasn't my family's story, but it's the story of a lot of my friends, my law partner, a lot of my friends who I went to, law, to school with. And as I say, um, my friends whose parents are Holocaust survivors, look, they don't have uncles and aunts, they don't have grandparents. They have a sense of responsibility um, it's stronger than they're just not kind of spoiled kids. And, um, and so for Allison, uh, she, she bonds with, and, and you know, there's a joke, why do parents and grandparents and grandchildren get along so well? Because they have a common enemy, which is the parents. So she, she, who's lost her mother very, very suddenly, and she was an only child too, she just bonds with him. And the relationship between the two of them is very, very strong. And um, his story, you know, I can tell you, Daniel, I get letters from, I'm very fortunate, the books are translated in a lot of languages, and I get letters from people all around the world saying, I really identify with Ari's relationship with his father. Not because he's Jewish, really has nothing to do with it. It's just, it's, it's really more someone who's gone through great suffering and yet has chosen Life And in many ways, that's the story of Canada. Look at how we take in refugees. And I've had so many of my clients from Vietnam, from Syria, from, you know, and, and this is the country where we welcome people. And we don't, this kind of goes back to what I want to say about homelessness. When you look at the States and you see all these gated communities, these super wealthy people with armed guards where they live, uh, and then this extreme poverty in Mexico, I don't think we want that. Uh, even the wealthiest of the wealthiest in, Tor in Toronto, at least, they don't live in these so-called gated communities that you see all over the states. And I think we're on the verge of that. And we really have to choose as a society. Do we want to be more compassionate or do we want to be more selfish? And, and I think what we've seen in the states, especially the last four horrible years, is, is the price of that kind of selfishness. So if we're not going to be that kind of society, how are we going to be a more civil society, and the answer is not easy. It's not easy. So, Robert, how would you say, um, it, it seems as though what, what I'm hearing on the news is that the, the so-called 1% has just gotten even wealthier throughout COVID. How do we stop this? How do we kind of try to uh, diminish the gap between the very wealthy and the very poor. You know, I went on a rant the other day with some friends. I was saying, like, I, 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 you're basically forced to use your visa card. So I can imagine that companies like Visa, like these companies are just making insane amounts of money. And yet I don't see any of the wealthiest people stepping up and saying, okay, we're going to fund, you know, we're going to give back. You know, it's very easy for people to give to the sick children's hospital because it's, you know, or to give to an animal shelter. Those are easy things. It's hard to donate to a drug addict who you see wandering around the street and scaring you. Um, and I'm not saying money is the answer. I'm not saying giving tents and, and, and socks is the answer. In fact, there's a great argument to say it's not the answer. But I, I think 
I think ultimately what COVID has done is it, it's shown, listen, we have thousands and thousands of people working in minimum wage jobs. Um, and they tend to be people from minority groups, immigrant people, people of color. And they don't have union protection. They don't have, I mean, thank God we have our medical system here. Um, and, and I think, I also think COVID has taught Canadians how different we are from the Americans. And, and, you know, when I grew up in Toronto, we were really wanted the Americans. Um, Toronto was so boring. I wanted to live in New York or Paris or London. I, I was just talking to my son last night. I was telling him, I said, why would you want to leave Toronto? Toronto's so great. And I think people feel like that about Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary. Uh, so I think it's brought a nascent sense of, sense of pride that we have. Um, but we shouldn't fool ourselves. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. Yes, not, not too long ago, right here in, in Montreal, we, we had um, a tent city. Uh, it grew and it grew uh, in the east end of the city uh, until uh, the, it kind of came to a bit of a crisis in December because there was a fire there and people were forced to leave. Mm -hmm. um, is that happening in Toronto? Do you have sort of a tent city out there in a specific neighborhood? Yes, in fact, where I live, I look out on Toronto. And I'm not happy about it. And I don't think it's a good thing. And, and unfortunately, it's in the poorest neighborhoods that you see the parks taken over by these tent cities. So if you think about it, um, Poor people don't have cottages to go to. They don't have rich friends with backyards. There's, now with COVID, they're stuck in a little place. This park near me, the kids couldn't go to the playground. The gardeners couldn't do their gardens. And even to this day, it's basically empty. And if you go a little bit further north, you see everyone out in the parks at night. Um, so clearly that's not the, not the answer. Um, and um, I, I have some ideas. I mean, it's... We're getting pretty deep into this, but the only country that really seems to have the solution is Finland, where they've got this huge commitment to housing and working with people who are homeless. And if you're an economist, if you think it's too expensive, here's a little known fact. It costs $1,000 every time someone goes to emergency work. $1,000 if you go because you got a cut finger. So what do homeless people do? They use all of these facilities. We see them in courts over and over again. Uh, they rob from people. They steal from people. That you know, it actually if you, it actually costs more not to work with people. Mm -hmm. but, so uh, in, in the book, you you do discuss what is the real cost of homelessness. Definitely, it comes up uh, in right. here. So I encourage all of you listening to read <laughs> Robert's book, which we will have shortly at the library. I'm sure. I know it's been ordered. Uh, Robert, uh, we, we talked extensively about this book. Um, can I ask you to give us a sneak peek at your next project? Well, what people don't realize is, <laughs> the funny thing is that my brain is really, like this book is finished for me because I finished it a few months ago and I'm deep into the next book, which I want to get out a year from now. I hope we're talking again. Um, all I can say, and I'm just going to give a little hint to people who know my books. Um, the next book is going to be an examination of a cold case. Now, I know a lot of my readers have been bugging me about something. It's going to take turns that they don't expect. Um, listen, my goal is to tell a very long story about a, a group of people. And the great thing, you know, Danielle, I spent 10 years writing my first book. I got a terrific agent in New York, couldn't sell it. I spent 10 years writing Old City Hall. I was so excited. I thought, I finally got a book published. I could go to a bookstore and buy it. And then about six months later, this weird thing happened. I see Ian Rankin's got 20 books. I, I want a whole shelf. <laughs> so I'm still a bit amazed that I have six books, but um, I want everyone, each one to be better. I want them to be tighter, cleaner, better written. Uh, I'm very proud of all of them, and what's lovely is people pick up, pick up a book and then they go back and read them all. But I'm very, very conscious that people not, will not read them in order. So you don't have to 
read from Old City All forward. It's better in a way, but it really doesn't matter. Each book stands on its own. And uh, so the next book is going to have a, a few big twists and turns. Um, but if anyone knows how to finish it, please tell me, because I'm at that horrible point for a writer where I'm about a third of the way through, and I have no idea how I'm going to finish the book. So, so that's what's going to torture me until June 30th, which is my next deadline. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, so you said it, it will be a cold case. Um, will there be any of the characters that we all of know them. from Downfall? Oh, yeah, all of them. They're in all the books. I mean, there's a few that come in, like Nancy Parrish kind of comes in and out. Her older partner, Ted DiPaolo, will probably be in the next book. Um, but the core of the book really is Green, his father, and his daughter, and then Daniel Kennecott, who's the young... Um, Prodigy. Papa works with him. Uh, but I really love work, writing about female characters. So, um, and it's fun. It's fun. I mean, the greatest compliment I get from people is they say, I'm really mad at you because I was up all night and I couldn't stop reading. <laughs> or they say, I'm three quarters of the way through. And I just got an email from someone saying, I'm three quarters of the way through. And I should go back and look and figure out who did it. But I just want to finish it which is really what you do. You know, Steve Jobs said, the hardest thing is simple. So when people say your book was easy to read, they don't know about the hundreds of hours I spent, going back to your first question, editing and cutting and cleaning up and getting word repetitions out and making sure the similes work and making sure people really care about the characters. So it's kind of like they're my, my other family, you know? <laughs> Yes, the, the characters are fantastic, and I have to say, I will admit that this is the first book of yours that I read, and uh, it really does stand alone. Uh, I will go back, as I'm sure uh, many people will, who start at the end and then go backwards. Uh, a lot of people at our library do that, um, but I like that I can just pick up a book uh, and I'm at home because your characters uh, have such depth. And, and as a reader, you can feel how much you care about your characters. So that yeah, comes that, across that, on the page. Daniel, you know, that's that to me is the nicest thing you could say. That's a real compliment. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Um, and so I bombarded you with questions. So let me see if the audience has any questions for you as well. So I'm inviting everyone now uh, who has a question for Robert uh, to please put Can it I see into people? the Q and A. So wait, wait for me to see people. No, I guess not. I can't. I'm sorry about that. Okay. okay. Um, but I, there are people. I'm going to do. In. Excuse me. Can I do yes. two seconds of promo? I'm going to invite. Yes, you of course. To go to my website. It's, it's my name, robertrodenberg.com. And if you're inclined to order the book, order it in week one because that helps me stay up on the bestsellers list and uh i respond to every email i get so if you write me give me a few days but i'll write you back and i've had correspondence with people for 12 years now and it's real fun i really enjoy that also, thank the books you are an audio tape which a lot of people like too yes and they're available at the library um this one is just coming in now i know it's on order so if we don't have it yet, uh, definitely you can put your name on the list, um, whether it's on audio, large type, regular type. Um, and and next, anyone, year I wanna, next year, Daniel, I want to come to Montreal in person. Uh, we would love to have you, definitely. Uh, that would be wonderful. Mais oui, nous, nous pouvons parler français. <laughs> okay, let's yes, get some yes. questions. Let's get some questions. Okay. Okay, so people are not too talkative just yet, uh, Robert. Um, I'm not going to bite. You can tell them I won't. <laughs> Maybe we touched upon this briefly, but uh, one of the things uh, I was told by Jillian at Simon & Schuster that uh, you were a pro at discussing was to discuss the common misconceptions about uh, the homelessness crisis and how your book aims to address them. 
Well, I think the main thing is, is I think the job of writer isn't to, isn't to pontificate. You know, it, it's more just to kind of try and shine a light on something. Um, famous example of this and I'm, is in 19, during the century in 1900s in the United States, the meatpacking companies in Chicago were disgusting. And there's a writer named Upton St. Clair. He wrote a book all about the workers in the, in the, um, in the meatpacking plant. And out of that book came all the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so when people say fiction isn't real, there's a line I love which says that fiction has an advantage over nonfiction because we can tell the truth. So you're going to think, that sounds ridiculous. But if, then, you know, if you want to know what it was like to live in London during the London, England during the industrial era. You'd read Dickens. If you want to know what it was like during the Dust Bowl in California, you'd read Steinbeck. So that's what I'm just trying to do. I'm just trying to write about the city as it is right now. And I'm not pontificating, I'm not saying these are the solutions, but that's what's engaging. And, and I think the great thing about crime writers is is you read an Ian Rankin book, you feel like you've been in Edinburgh. You read a Donna Leon book, you feel like you've been in Venice. You read an Andrea Camilleri book, you feel like you've been in Sicily. And I feel like I've traveled all these places that I've never been. Well, I was in Venice once. But um, just buy the book because, you know, as you said, the, the city is a, is a character. You know what? Um, I think authors reading their, from their books is kind of boring, but if we have a few minutes, I'd be very happy to read the opening paragraph. Yes, please, please do. I teach writing to a lot of people, and I always say, well, what do you need to establish at the opening of a book, a play, a movie, a song? You have to establish a lot of things very, very quickly. You have to establish a character. And characters are often made up by the people in their family. You have to establish setting. You have to establish mood. You have to establish some action. Something has to happen. And most of all, you have to care. So when I do readings, uh, I, I never read a lot of my book, but I often just read the first paragraph of a book. And then I say to people, are you in or are you out? So to the people who are listening, I'm going to read uh, the first paragraph, chapter one of <clears throat> Downfall. Because the subways in Toronto didn't run early enough, Jember Roshan had no choice but to ride his bicycle to work. His wife, Babita, was not pleased. In Canada, it is dark in November, and you don't even have light, she'd said when he was getting dressed to leave. She was right, of course, but what else could he do? They needed to buy diapers for the twins, and the rent on their one-bedroom apartment, on their one-bedroom apartment, was due in a week. I promise that I will be careful, he told her, as he was rushing out the door, but she refused to kiss him goodbye. In seven years of marriage, she never done that before. So maybe people can vote if they're in or they're out. If you're one of my writing students, you better be prepared to write that first paragraph 15, 20, 30, 40 times until you get it right. Well, that, that's great advice. Definitely you have to catch uh, your reader right from the start. Uh, and we're looking forward to your next project as well. And of, of course, if we're all safe and have our vaccine and everything seems to be back to a more regular normal, we would love to host you. I'd love to have you at the Kotzenhoek Library next summer, uh, if possible. Great. I guess we don't have any questions. you got shy people. I thought Montreal was not going. I, I'm surprised at how shy they are. Um, <laughs> perhaps it's because of the topic or just because they haven't gotten to read it yet. Uh, but I'm sure after this interview, um, they, they will want to read it. Thank you so much, uh, Robert, for taking time out of your day and your very busy schedule uh, for talking about your latest book. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. It's been a real pleasure.